Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelzer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. Uh, today, my colleague and co-host Sam Wong can't join us. We're continuing in a series of podcasts we've been having with different uh, figures uh, to share with us their thoughts and wisdom about uh, the current pandemic that we're in. Uh, the, the pandemic is obviously a lot about healthcare and medicine, unlike a, a war overseas. This battle is taking place with scientists in the lab, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, treating patients, public health officials who are tracking this disease and trying to figure out how we move to a better place. Uh, but healthcare, of course, is intertwined with public policy. Uh, public policy support the entire infrastructure that we're talking about, and they are also at the center of this debate, not only for the cure, but just as important for the recovery. Uh, and some issues which a few months ago seemed uh, not even to be part of the discussion in terms of healthcare, now are front and center. Today to talk through this uh, with us, we have a fantastic guest, uh, Dr. Richard Besser, who's president and CEO of the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation, which is right here near Princeton University, took over this job uh, in April 2017. Yesterday, after we had already booked him, uh, Governor Jersey and a multi-state regional board, uh, which will be working on how to restart the economy. He is the forming act former acting director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also an ABC News former chief health and medical uh, editor. Uh, he's done uh, many, many things. I want to get uh, to the conversation, but uh, he's been involved in his government work uh, on issues such as H1N1, uh, the influenza pandemic. So he's been on the front line uh, of, of these sorts of battles, so has a lot to uh, tell us about. So uh, first, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Julian. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here. So, I mean, uh, Kind of let me start with the role uh, that you uh, assumed yesterday. Um, I don't know exactly when it starts, but what are some of the pivotal measures and marks that uh, we need to see uh, as we try to get back to some kind of normal economy in this in this region and throughout the country? Yeah. So what was what was just announced was was a, a regional group to try and look and decide. Uh, when it's safe to think about resuming the economic activity that's so so important, and how you do that in a way that's that's safe for the public. And so, uh, there's seven states that are involved in in this regional uh, effort, and uh, each state is allowed three people to participate. One is the chief of staff for the for the governor. Uh, another is someone with some expertise in public health, and then the third is someone with uh, background or expertise in in uh, the economy and and how uh, how important it is to to get the economy going from from a public health perspective um, you know there there are a number of things that that you need to think about when you're thinking about uh, uh, reducing the level of of recommendations of for for physical distancing and what we're seeing around the country is that places that have implemented pretty significant uh, physical distancing are seeing a leveling off uh, of of the 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 uh, we could, we talk about it in, in public health as an epidemic curve, but it's really the the number of infections that they see per day. Um, by keeping people away from each other, the virus is, is it's harder for it to spread, and we're seeing fewer cases. That's allowing a number of things to happen. It's allowing the healthcare system to catch up. Uh, we'd seen horrific photos from from New York City and and other places of of hospitals that were overwhelmed, uh, uh, healthcare workers without proper protective equipment, uh, and a lack of capacity to take care of people who who were sick. Um, by doing this physical distancing, the hope is that uh, you, you won't shut off transmission totally, but you'll have it at a low enough rate that you're able to take care of people who who are sick. If you start then thinking about saying, okay, let's people can go out, they can gather, they can do various activities, you are going to see more disease transmission. That's a that's a given. And you want to be able to do it in a in a controlled fashion. So in order to be able to do that, you want to make sure that you're you're seeing a downward trend in your community. So fewer cases each day. In order to know whether that's the case, you have to be able to test people. And right now there's there's shortages of, of test kits around the country. So the ability to know 
really what's going on in the ground in the community is is really left to you know how many people are coming into the hospital how many people are being hospitalized uh, what's the occupancy of your intensive care unit and that's really not enough you really want to be able to test anyone with even mild symptoms this is a virus that we think can spread uh, uh, and cause a range of disease from very severe disease requiring hospitalization to infection with absolutely no symptoms. And so you could be having a significant amount of disease in your community and not be seeing it. And you wanna be able to make sure that people with symptoms can be, can be tested. So that's, that, that, that's one piece. You wanna make sure there's enough personal protective equipment so that people in healthcare are protected. But also, as you start to resume activities in the community, there may be others in the community that you wanna have personal protective equipment for. So making sure that that, that piece is, is in place. And then when I think about it from a, from a public health perspective, there, there are a lot of very intriguing plans that are out there. And they all call for shifting phases. So right now we're in a phase where everyone in America is being asked to do pretty much the same thing. And that's keep away from everybody else, stay home unless you have to go out and buy food or, or, or get medications or essential, essential uh, uh, types of employment. But you then want to be able to switch to a mode where you're identifying a case early, someone who's infected early. You're isolating them. You're hospitalizing them if they need it. But most people will be able to manage this uh, infection just fine at home. But you want them to be in a setting where they're not going to spread it to other people. So some people can do that in their homes, but, but there are millions of people who can't. So you want to be thinking about, okay, what can we provide for people so that they could isolate safely? In some countries, they're using the excess hotel capacity and, and putting people up in hotels. Uh, there are a lot of ways to approach this, but it needs to be approached. The other is you, you wanna do what's called contact tracing. And this is the, one of the oldest tools in public health. It's used for tuberculosis control, it's used for controlling sexually transmitted diseases. And what it involves is you interview someone who's ha who has the infection and you find out all of the people that they had contact with during the period that they were potentially contagious. And you ask those people to go home, keep away from people for 14 days. If they get sick, you test them and you repeat that cycle. So you know, that type of, of identification of cases and contact tracing is, is really important. And to do that, it requires a lot of people. It's very labor intensive. You know, there are technology tools that may, may help with this, but our, our public health uh, workforce has, has really declined over the past 15 years as we've, we've, we've decreased our investments in, in preparedness and response. And uh, you know, in order to do this, you know, there are a lot of people who are out of jobs who could be trained up to be contact uh, uh, tracers. It's not that hard to do, it just takes some basic training. But you can see it actually as a, as a work program uh, employ people from the communities in which they're going to be doing contact tracing, and that helps with trust, which is critical during a uh, during a health crisis. Um, and then spend a lot of time with communication, getting people revved up so they understand why you're doing this, how it will benefit everybody, and what the stages are to move, to move forward. So that's very helpful. So there's three pillars: testing, uh, facilities to make sure isolation can happen when it recurs. Uh, and contact tracers to keep track of, of what is happening as a, and, and making sure uh, medical facilities have what they need. That's kind of an infrastructure for then having an economy running again and a society running again, uh, even if there's no vaccine yet, uh, kind of a, a way to manage this in the interim. But does, does that mean, if, if those were in place, are we looking at the same kind of world we had two months ago yeah. or would it still be different in the interim yeah and i i think that's where uh, it would be really helpful to be hearing from cdc every day to to talk this through because the the new normal coming out of this is going to look different and it's going to look different because um you know in you know hopefully there will be a vaccine there's no there's no guarantee that there ever will be a vaccine but you know with all the efforts hopefully there there will be one uh, but until then, and even with a vaccine, some people may not get full protection. Um, there are people who are at high risk of having severe disease and dying from this. And so you're going to want to make sure that those people are protected. 
One thing we don't know right now is how much disease has already come through communities. And there's tests that are, that are being developed. There's one that's been licensed. Um, but to be able to go through a community and, and do something called serologic testing, it's, it's blood testing to look for antibodies, which are protective factors. And it may be that in some communities, a significant number of people have had this infection. Uh, and if we're able to show that, that certain levels of immunity, uh, certain levels of antibody equal protection, then they could go back to work. They could be working around people who are at higher risk. They could do some of those things to protect people who are, who are really um, at, at the highest risk here. For the rest of us, you know, some of the things that are described in terms of what the experience might be like going to a restaurant uh, with fewer tables and, and uh, you know, wait staff who are wearing masks and gloves, uh, that may be the new reality in schools that have, you know, staggered sessions and, and workplaces that have staggered sessions so that you're able to maintain some degree of, of social distancing until you reach the point where this has burned itself out in the community, either because people have gotten it or are now immune, or there's a vaccine and, and there's enough protection. And would there be a plan, um, and obviously we don't know, but for intermittent closings of, of institutions, but not this long? I mean, would that be part of the thinking? You know, I've, I've, I've seen some interesting uh, pieces written about that. that. That's one way to go, where you would think about opening schools, but then having, having breaks. You know, so as, as disease starts to come up in a community, then things shut down for a couple of weeks. And then as things start to come back, uh, you know, you, 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 you start activity again, as disease comes back, you then think about having another pause. In order to do that though, um, we, are, uh, we are really hurting in from a policy perspective. Uh, we do not have, uh, have any, any, we're near the kinds of supports, uh, social supports, to ensure that everyone in America has the opportunity to protect themselves and their family. And at the, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, when, when we think about health, uh, we think about it being more than just having access to high quality healthcare. It's about jobs paying a living wage, uh, people have, uh, living in homes that are safe and affordable and not the threat of, a, a, of eviction, access to, to healthy food, um, you know, schools that are truly meeting their children's needs. These are the, the factors that, that really drive, uh, drive people's health in this country. And for too many people in this country, before this crisis, they were living in poverty. Uh, people, uh, you know, half the country living paycheck to paycheck. When you have a crisis like this, it just exacerbates the underlying uh, structural uh, and systemic uh, inequities that we, we have as a society. So there's a tension in the policy, meaning uh, on the one hand, this requires social distancing, closing things down for now. But on the other hand, that will make worse because of the economy and it will do so unequally. Uh, these other pillars of, of health, um, That's right. having a nice home, having access to food, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, some of the things we're seeing here in terms of short-term policy moves by, by government, uh, we need to, in, in a moment of calm, think about how we transition to long-term. Uh, th things like uh, national standards for sick and family leave so that everybody in the nation, if they're sick or have a family member who's sick, is able to stay home and, and protect themselves, their community, and, and take care of their family. You know, there, there are 28 million people in this country who don't have health insurance. And yet, when you, when you look at the recommendations that came from public health, you know, some of the, the, the most important ones around this pandemic were around not overwhelming the healthcare system. And if you were sick, calling your doctor, um, letting them know how you're doing, they'll tell you if you need to get tested. Well, if you don't have a doctor, who are you going to call? And, you know, here in, 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 in Princeton, the testing facility is a drive-through facility out at one of the malls. Well, if you don't have a car and you don't have a doctor to refer you for testing, you're going to be in the emergency room. And if you didn't have COVID before, you're going to have it when you leave. And, you know, these are things that have to be built into the planning. And, and they're not. They're afterthoughts. And, you know, you look at the data from around the country and, and see that Black Americans are being hit at higher rates. They're dying at higher rates. It's no surprise that this is happening. We have a system that's geared towards that result. And uh, I mentioned earlier and that, that you worked on uh, 
uh, H1N1 uh, before in the Centers for Disease Control. I'm curious, what did you learn from that experience professionally that kind of gives you some insights into what needs to be happening today? Yeah, you know, I, I, I directed emergency preparedness response at CDC for four years. And uh, my first day on the job was the day Katrina hit New Orleans. And, you know, so I was engaged in a lot of the after action reviews from that that talked about our, our failing infrastructure, the need for a public health system, the need to prepare, need to do scenario planning. Um, I was very involved following you know, 911 and the anthrax attack and the need to prepare with countermeasures and the stockpile. I oversaw the stockpile for four years. Um, what you see over time is that you know, during a crisis, there's, there's all kinds of resources. There's money available. Usually the year right after, there's a lot of money available. And then after that, no one wants to hear about it anymore. They're tired of being scared. They're tired of anxiety. They want to spend money on the, the current issues. And so once again, our systems decline and we get into a position where, where we're at risk. I, I think one of my biggest lessons from H1N1 in, in 2009 was the importance of honest, transparent communication from public health leaders. And we're not getting that in this crisis. We're hearing almost all of our messaging coming from political leaders. And when that happens, um, it's, it's pretty hard as the public not to think that no one knows what they're doing because what you recommend at one point in time is gonna change as you learn. So for instance, early on there was a recommendation, masks don't have value here, don't use masks. Then a month later, the recommendation is people should use masks when they go outside. Well, you know, without hearing from the public health scientists in terms of what did they learn that made them change that recommendation, um, it, it doesn't lead to the kind of trust that you want to see that leads people to follow those recommendations. It's like the, the old, you know, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't instill confidence. And what are the, uh, you're now on this multi-state board in terms of the state level, uh, you worked at the federal level, but what are you seeing from the states in terms of where there are effective uh, responses and policies taking place? Kind of what, what would you highlight as this is what we need more of? Yeah, you know, um, as a group, we haven't met yet. So um, uh, I think our first meetings will either be this weekend or, or the beginning of, of next week. Um, but I, I, I think that, that, you know, some of the policy fixes we saw coming from states earlier in terms of expansion of, of, of access to healthcare, expansion of, of uh, access to SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, there were some states that were gonna implement work requirements that are taking those away because there's a recognition that something like work requirements uh, knocks a lot of people off of the, uh, the enrollment at a time when they need it. Uh, states that put in, in place moratoria on evictions and foreclosures and shutting off utilities. These things were occurring at the state level ahead of at the federal level. And, and we need to see, see more of those activities taking place uh, around the country. And can the states handle this if, as opposed to the federal government? There's obviously certain problems, at least historians say, only the national government can really handle. But you're obviously going to be working in this new multi-state strategy that is happening in different parts of the country. Can that work? Um, given the flow of travel and business, uh, is it, I mean, what do you think of that? Well, I, I think that there's things that states need to do and there are things that the things the federal government needs to do. And, uh, you know, for one, uh, having a, a framework that everyone uh, buys into at the federal level is really important. Um, the application of that, though, needs to take place uh, regionally or, or at the state level because pandemics don't occur at the same rate uh, or in the same time course in all places at the same time. So we're, you know, we, we were seeing very high activity in New York City that's starting to plateau. There's some cities that haven't been hit really hard yet um, and probably will get hit hard. Maybe not as hard as New York because of social distancing. But you wanna be able to react to what's going on where you are. And that's, that's why that, that issue of surveillance, being able to test people uh, very readily so you know what's going on. You know, some places, 
some countries that, that say they have no cases of coronavirus, well, it's easy to have no cases if you have no test kits. Right. You know, it's the same thing in the U.S. Some of, some of the poorer states that early on were saying they had no disease really didn't have access to, uh, to testing. So having a national strategy that is then uh, applied regionally uh, will be very helpful. And the, other, the other piece is that the national strategy that was just put out uh, was, uh, I, I think, misses a number of pieces that are critically important. And states can say, fine, we're doing more than that. The national strategy did not employ uh, what's recommended by so many in terms of case identification, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. And those pieces, if, you, if we truly believe that everyone should have the right to protect themselves and, and others, um, that means putting money in people's pockets, not just once, but repeatedly over time and making sure that people have a safe place to stay if they have to be isolated in quarantine. That will take a lot of dollars. And states, as you know, can't run deficits the way that uh, the federal government can. And so it will take federal dollars to do that. So you know, without buy-in from the, at the federal level, states are going to be uh, you know, a little bit um, uh, constrained in terms of, of what they want to do. And as we're recording this, uh, which is on uh, Friday, April 17th, this will air later uh, next week, but President Trump is tweeting out, liberate Minnesota, I can't remember, liberate a bunch of states. Um, and I'll put President Trump aside, but it clearly will play to some people who are sitting, asking why they're doing this, scared, genuinely scared about what happens to their kids and what happens to their finances. Can you explain why is this different than other bad diseases, whether it's the flu uh, or whether it's other situations we faced where we didn't have to shut everything down? Kind of why is this pretty draconian response necessary in this case as opposed to other things we've had? Yeah, you know, when I, when I, th when I think back to 2009 and the, and the uh, H1N1 swine flu pandemic, um, we didn't have to do this. And so people say, well, what's, what's so different here? Well, there are a couple things that are different. One is we got really lucky in 2009. Instead of this being, instead of that being an influenza pandemic on the scale of the uh, uh, 1918 uh, influenza pandemic, uh, it was very mild. Uh, we didn't know that up front, but had it, had it been um, as severe as 1918, we would have gone for social distancing very much like is, is taking place now. Um, so there, there was some luck involved. The reason this is so severe is that the, 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 the level of population protection in terms of underlying immunity is very, very low. And so there are a lot of people at high risk here for severe disease and, and death. Um, and because there isn't protection within the community when it, when it hits, if you don't do something to control how fast it hits, your healthcare system's overwhelmed. And when it, the healthcare system's overwhelmed, not only can it not take care of people who have coronavirus, um, just think about those people who are having a heart attack, those people who are having appendicitis, those people who you know, fall and break a hip. Um, where are they gonna go? Think about all the patients who have cancer and are needing cancer treatment and surgery. Um, those things don't go away. And so we're counting the number of cases of coronavirus and we're counting the number of people who die from coronavirus, uh, but the other impacts in terms of, of chronic disease, chronic disease management, we're, we're not seeing. And uh, a healthcare system that's not able to take care of people who need help um, is, is, a, is a pretty frightening specter as, as we've seen in Italy, as we've seen in, in New York City. So um, and we have a few more minutes, but coming out of it, you've been very clear. Uh, so I, I hope your words get out there in terms of what we need in the short term uh, and long short term to recover, uh, to reach a point of quasi normality, which will be normality. Um, but in terms of the issues you study before and RWJ talks about, what are some long term kind of healthcare changes that we need to address? Uh, yeah as we get through this, after we get through this, that are related to what we're going through that would put us in better shape five years from now? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's discussions about, about you know, the power of, of pandemics to reshape society. And 
I hope coming out of this, we have conversations at the political level around what kind of society do we want to have and, and what's important. Do we truly believe that everyone in America should have a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being? Um, do we believe that the American dream is something that should actually be real and attainable for all? Um, on the healthcare side, uh, the idea that we're the richest nation in the world, but we don't ensure that everyone has health insurance, I, I think should be unacceptable. Um, the idea that we don't, we don't ensure that people have a living wage, which is one of the most important things for health, to be able to have enough money to put food on the table. Uh, that we haven't done, uh, done more and, and faced, uh, you know, faced straight on the, the implications of structural racism that have, have led to people of color living in communities that are underinvested in and what that means in terms of health. We're, we're sitting here, I don't know where you are, I'm in Princeton. You're in Princeton? I'm, in, I'm out of the city. I live in the city, but we're in Long Island. Today. Okay, well, I'm, I'm in Princeton, New Jersey, and someone born here in Princeton, New Jersey has a life expectancy of 87 years. Mm -hmm. I, I work as a volunteer pediatrician in, in Trenton, New Jersey, which is uh, uh, 15 miles away, and a child born near my clinic there has a life expectancy of 73 years. So this is within the same county, we see a we see a 14 year difference in life expectancy. Um, that's not just about having access to healthcare. It's about everything. It's about the quality of the air and the water, and how we let people of color live in communities where it's not fit to breathe or, or drink the water. It's about the the quality of schools and and whether they value each child and each family. So you know when we think about what it takes for health, healthcare is part of it. Um, but one of the things that concerns me in the current political climate is that too many people equate healthcare with health, and they're, they're very different. Uh, they're, they're, there's a relation, but if we just give people health insurance, um, that's not gonna deal with that differential in terms of life expectancy or quality of life. It's not gonna mean that in the next time we have a pandemic, and we will have future pandemics. That's, that's a guarantee. You know, Pandemics occur with, with some regularity, and they're gonna continue to, to, uh, to occur. But if we don't address these fundamental societal issues, um, next time we have a pandemic, we'll be in the same boat, and it's going to hit uh, uh, certain communities harder than harder than others. And one last question: Why are pandemics going to be more common in the United States? They haven't. I mean, we haven't had that many of them. Certainly not of this magnitude. Why should we expect more of them? Well, um, you know, if you if you think about the world of emerging infectious diseases. Um, New pathogens tend to come where you have an interface, a close interface of humans, animals, and the environment, uh, where, where people are encroaching on the environment. Um, and so uh, whether it's new strains of flu, those tend to emerge in places where people and animals um, are living, living in very close proximity. Uh, coronavirus, these, this one and SARS, again, a similar situation. Um, Populations are, are continuing to encroach on environments uh, that they weren't in before. Travel, global travel means that, that uh, you know, an, an outbreak that may have wiped out a village and gone no further is likely to spread from there. Uh, it's a whole nother conversation around, around uh, how pathogens evolve, but there's this concept of one health that, that says you really need to look at the physical environment, the animal environment, and the human environment, and how they intersect. Um, and the, the speed of travel uh, means that you know, a, a, new, a new disease anywhere is a threat everywhere. That's why it's, why it's, this is, it's so important we, we don't step back from our role in the global community, that we embrace it, that we help ensure that, uh, that diseases can be detected quickly wherever they emerge and be controlled there. Uh, it's it's important from a from a social justice perspective, and it's also important from our own self interest. Yeah, one last last question that you made you pra you still practice, which is remarkable given everything else you've done a, a bit. I'm sure. Uh, why for you? I mean, why do you do you keep doing that, and how does it help you with your other work at RWJ and and now in this position? Yeah, you know, it's um, I've maintained a half day pediatric practice throughout my entire career. And whether you know, I was in academia for a period, and then at CDC, and then at ABC, and now and now here, 
and what I what I see in uh, in the clinics in which I work, they've always been federally qualified health centers, community clinics. Um, I see these these issues play out every time I'm in clinic. And to be fair, I'm not in clinic now uh, uh, during this crisis. Um, I don't think it would be be fair to uh, a, as a half day volunteer to put pressure on their protective equipment. Uh, but these issues in terms of, of connections of community to health um, play, play out in every community I've seen. And, and whether it's children living in environments uh, where, where they're exposed to uh, unclean air and, and you know, we're managing that by treating their asthma rather than preventing their asthma. Uh, children who have, have special learning needs who are waiting years to get services that others in other communities get, get right away. Uh, parents who are struggling to put food on the table, working multiple jobs with no sick leave, no unemployment insurance, no access to health insurance. Uh, immigrants, uh, some of whom are, uh, lack documentation, who are even afraid to get health care. Um, you know, these issues that I see in clinic um, make me more, uh, more passionate about the work that we do and the, the urgency of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, thanks very much. Our guest again was Dr. Richard Besser, president and CEO of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and now working on this multi-state uh, board uh, for Governor Murphy, trying to figure out how to get us all collectively started again. So thanks again for joining our show. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Once again, you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify. Visit our website, politicspolls.princeton.edu, for show archives and information. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and we'll be back soon on Politics and Polls.